All right, today I'm talking with uh, Michael Beinhorn. Michael is well-known record producer. Um, if you're not familiar with his work, I suggest you uh, look him up. He's done some amazing recordings and you should know about them. But today <laughs> I'm going to be talking with Michael about the very beginning of his music career and some of the people that he met along the way. Hi, Michael. How you doing? Hey, how are you, Rick? Good. So you were born in New York, right? That's right, yeah. And you went to high school there, right? That's right. All right. So the period of time we're going to be talking about is like the late 70s. So around 77, 78, um, what, do you, what, what is the music scene in New York like that you're exploring? Ah. Uh. Well, it was, I, I, I mean, it's, it's so hard to put, it, it was so fertile, like it was just exploding. It was incre really incredible. I mean, you had um, the first wave of punk bands who were still, you know, playing clubs, but, but you know, by, by that stage, they were starting to move out of that whole kind of circuit. And then you had like an you know the next stage of of punk bands and you know other artists that were, you know that 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 were coming from Europe and 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 starting out in in the states. You know there was the there were no wave bands, um, and yeah, no, there were no artists wave just starting to get a a, la a label at that time. Oh, oh man! I mean, it was it was amazing. I mean, everywhere you went, there was just this sense of constant activity it was the sense of electricity in the streets you know wherever you went i mean particularly once you got around like 23rd street like you, you're into, into chelsea and you started moving downtown from there everything like everything changed like you could feel the vibe around you sort of like start to kind of you know get more and more intense and the further downtown you went the more you could feel this vibe and it was just so exciting. I mean, it was a little, it was kind of scary too, because like New York wasn't exactly the safest place in the world back then. So you didn't know it was coming at you around the corner. But as far as the music that was being made and just the promise, <clears throat> there was a sense that anything could happen at any time. You know, people would run into each other in the streets and, you know, alliances were formed, fights got started, you know, it was just, it was an amazing time to be alive. So in 77, you're still in high school, right? That's right, yeah. So, so how old are you and what, and what kind of clubs are you able to go to at that age? I was 17. I mean, I think I'd been to CBGB's once. Um, I was very intimidated by it. Uh, <laughs> I had a friend from high school had a band called The Blessed, who were kind of, um, they were, you know, I mean, the, I guess you can't use the words, that, well, they, were, they were kind of like a standard punk rock band, but they were pretty much scenesters. And, you know, they, they did the hall works, so they came on with the leather, play like fast, da -da 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 type songs, spat at the audience, the audience spat back at them. And, you know, I mean, I, I really wasn't cut from that cloth, so I was kind of in the background, sort of like <laughs> a little bit. Uh, and you know, but but mainly at that point in time, I'd started exploring the downtown area because, as I, I told you the other day, one of my favorite record stores in Creation um, moved down there, and it was a place called Pantasia. Yeah. And And it was one of the people who worked there was a guy named Cliff Coltrane, who, you know, we later, was later the guitarist for Zoo Band and Material. Right. And that's where I met Cliff. And Pantasia used to be in Washington Heights. And I would go there almost every day after high school and just like scour the racks, just looking for something, anything, you know. Mm -hmm. Most of it was music that I'd never heard before. So I'd just go on based on covers. And like recommendations and things like that.
Right. And so Pantasia moved down to the East Village. Me and Fred Moore, who became the drummer for Material, uh, we made our way downtown. So Fred's a lot younger than you, even. He's three years younger than me. So, and did you guys go to high school together? Is that how you knew each other? No, 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 no. no. Fred and I met one night. Um, <clears throat> someone was having a party in some rehearsal space in a rehearsal uh, studio called uh, Daily Planet that was in a rehearsal building on 31st Street between 7th and 8th Avenues. And uh, so I was up there. I knew a lot of the people from high school, but Fred and I just started hanging out and we bonded over, I, I don't remember exactly. We just enjoyed, we just enjoyed each other's company. He didn't know a lot of the music that I knew at that time. He was more of a Zeppelin head and things like that. Uh, are you both uh, playing um, instruments at this point? I mean, Fred's a drummer. Is he playing drums at that age? He was playing drums at that age, yeah. Uh, he was in a band called 1121. Uh, I, don't, I think he was in the band before we met. I don't quite remember. But yeah, he was playing with them. And I was playing, I, I bought a synthesizer. So I started playing that in bands because that was kind of a really rare and unusual commodity for people to have. And uh, okay. it was, I bought myself a micro mode. <laughs> Do you remember those? Uh, not really. I mean, I was into the modular since then too. In 1980, I bought a used ARP 2600 and uh, that was a lot of, I kind of learned synthesis on that. I imagine that's what you were yeah. Well, yeah, the 2600 was really, that was the one that I would go into the music stores and fiddle around with until the guys were like, you're going to buy something, kid, or you're going to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I just stand like making sounds and stuff until they kicked me out. Um, so this 1121 is, uh, um, you, you kind of hook up with them and start playing with them, right? Um, I was more of a peripheral character and that whole thing i don't really recall playing any gigs with them per se i mean they had a keyboard player at one point i mean i, I think i jammed with them a bunch of times but it was more kind of like i was i was sort of there i think uh -huh. you know they were like a bunch of like some of them were kids who'd gone who went to like prep schools and some of them went to art and design like fred went to art and design high school i went to music and art so we were sort of it was, you know, different worlds, kind of. So what kind of jamming or playing with other musicians were you doing at this time? Um, whatever anyone knew. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know. So you would just hook up with people and take your synthesizer? Pretty much. Pretty much, yeah. Is I mean, if you're in a room with a synthesizer, everyone would start playing Chameleon by Herbie Hancock. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was that kind of thing uh yeah yeah so just to let people know this band 1121 is still uh active today and uh they have a website so if uh, anybody's interested in exploring that it's easy to look up are you still in touch with those guys at all um we're friends on facebook i haven't spoken to any of them in a while how about fred i haven't spoken to fred in years yeah. I, yeah. I, myself, I was trying to track him down and, and uh, just exchange email with him last week. Um, uh -huh. I'm hoping to talk to him pretty soon. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. That's, that's great. Um, somewhere along the line, you also uh, not only meet a guy named Martin BC, but you end up rooming with him, I believe, right? <laughs> yeah. I stayed at Martin's, he had an apartment. Um, Martin, I think, actually knew Fred before I did. Like, he was part of that whole scene of people. He was kind of hanging out with the guys in 1121. Yeah, he um, said he, he did the fog machine for them at their shows. <laughs> he might have done. I, I have no idea. I mean, I met Martin through those guys. Okay. And he was, in the, he was like a prep school kid. Like, he went to Lycée Francais. <clears throat> and... Um, 
he was he lived on like Madison between 88th and 89th in this you know luxury high rise and stuff uh-huh. uh and um yeah we that's that's how we met later on when I was uh, homeless uh, yeah, I stayed at his, uh, he had like a railroad uh, style flat on East 92nd Street. And I lived there for a little while. Uh-huh. So um, you and uh, Fred end up uh, seeing some kind of an mm -hmm. ad for looking for musicians. Can you tell me a little bit about, uh, you said this was in the record, you saw this in a record, in that record store you were telling me about. Can you tell me well, about that ad and what it is that, that motivated you to answer it? These are flyers. And Fred and I, while we, when we did our little forays, you know, into the East Village, mainly to Pantasia, which was always like the end destination. It was, you know, it was just like, a, it was the outing. Um, we started seeing these flyers that had been posted on sides of buildings, lampposts, everywhere, mailboxes. And, you know, we, we looked at one and it said, do you like these bands or something like that? And we looked at, on it and this flyer had the names of every single band that we followed. And you have to understand at this point in time, the music that we like, you know, me in particular, I think, it was really, really like just off the wall, like as off the wall as you could possibly get at that point, European prog rock, you know? I mean, obviously there were artists like Brian Eno, but it was, you know, everyone in <clears throat> the entire scope, it was like the, the Gem Records import catalog <laughs> list, like someone had gone through that um, which is kind of like a Bible back then, if you wanted to find, you know, the, you know, the most recent obscure prog rock record and it copied all the names out of that and put it on this flyer. And we were both like, oh shit, like that, like this is some serious stuff. Because we didn't know anybody in the entire city who was interested in this kind of music at all. And it was pretty lonely. So to see this, was like, wow, this is definitely going to be a lot better than playing with some band who wants to hang, you know, play blues riffs or chameleon. So mm -hmm. it had an address on it and a phone number. So Fred calls the phone number and we make an appointment, I guess, to come on over and uh, meet the people who are there. And so what do you, what do you tell them to get them interested in talking to you? Well, the flyer was basically an open call. It was like, come on down, you know, call this number. This is where we are kind of thing. So they were, they, they were just looking for people who responded to the ad, who were interested in what, or, or the flyer, who were interested in what was on this flyer. So we wound up going down. So Fred has been playing in a band for a little while and has developed some drumming skills You've had your synthesizer now for how long and what kind of skills would you describe yourself as having at this point? Um, I had this, I've had the synth, I had the synth at that point for about like three years, two and a half years. Oh, okay. Um, and in fairness, I think any skills I had practicing piano were pretty much gone by that <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, you, so you did play piano at one point <laughs> I played piano at one point and I just I, it, it just kind of it, it, it faded away very quickly um, my keyboard skills were never top notch uh, but I was really fascinated with the sonic possibilities of the synthesizer so at that point, I, I, you know, with that instrument, certainly, which is very rudimentary, of course, that's a single oscillator instrument. Right. Uh, super rudimentary. Um, you know, I, I could get, I could make my way around the thing. Uh-huh. So you go to this meeting. Um, tell us where the meeting is and what happened. Uh, the meeting was at... Uh, 
<laughs> an industrial townhouse at 140 West 24th Street. And it belonged to a guy named George Okomelsky, who I believe is the person who answered it. It was either him or Bill Laswell who answered the door. Um, whoever it was, you know, they let us in. And we just shot the shit with them for a little while. Okay. Um, I want to bring up a, a picture. You mentioned Giorgio Gomelsky, and he's, he's uh, going to play a major role in the story we're talking about here. And uh, let, me, let me just... Uh... There he is. So many of the people watching this are going to know who Bill Laswell is. But many of them are not going to know who Giorgio Gomelsky is. How would you describe Giorgio Gomelsky to these people? <laughs> um, well, uh, it depends what context he needs to be described in, because that's not something very easily done in you know in a short sitting. You know, Giorgio is a very complex individual. He was. Uh, he was very, very, very worldly, very knowledgeable. Um, he knew many people. Uh, he was, in, in, many, in many ways, he was brilliant, I'd say. He was definitely a trendsetter of sorts. I mean, he could see, he definitely had kind of like a, an, an eye and an ear for things that were coming down the pike. Um, he is responsible for producing many records that people are familiar with now and wouldn't necessarily associate him with, such as producing, I, I'd say most of, if not all of the best Yardbirds records. Um, he produced a couple by Gong, some by Magma. Um, ooh, I forget some of the other ones that he worked on, you know, but he managed a lot of bands. Soft Machine. Yeah. So, okay, um, he established the Crawdaddy Club in swing, 60s Swinging London, which is one of the uh, premier nightclubs, uh, and also the first to feature the Rolling Stones, who, be, who were the house band there for a little while, and whom Giorgio managed for approximately one weekend. Um, <clears throat> he also has the unique uh, distinction of having introduced the Stones to the Beatles. Because that is obviously what kickstarted their career right there, you know. Yeah. So Giorgio is kind of at the crossroads for a great many people, including us. On the other side of it, Giorgio is nuts. He's a fucking loon. Um, he, yeah, that, <laughs> his nickname was the Rock and Roll Rasputin. The Rock and Roll Rasputin, yeah. Um, probably for his... Uh, Eastern European background and his persuasive character um, and his swarthy good looks. But yeah, he was a nut job. He was pretty unhinged. And, uh, you know, he, I think he was probably bipolar to tell you the truth. Uh, hmm. he, was a, a, he was a very unusual man, let's put it that way. Okay. You go to this meeting, and it's at Giorgio's place, right? Yeah. And, uh, and you're meeting him and Bill Laswell. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you guys talked about at the meeting and you know how that, that first meeting apparently went pretty well because um, <laughs> you guys end up working together later. But I mean, I, I can't you, even uh, say. They were, Giorgio was already <laughs> thinking about I mean, he came to New York in 78. You meet with him in, uh, do you remember what, what month, roughly? I mean, it must be around uh, September, something like that. I don't even know. Because he's, Giorgio's, uh, he came to New York sometime in mid-78. And, uh, and uh, he, by the time you're meeting with him, he's already planning this, uh, this big festival that he wants to do. And he's already planning on bringing David Allen over from Europe to work with whatever musicians uh, he's able to round up in New York. And you're going to be one of them. 
Um, <laughs> was there any talk of this festival or of da working with David Allen at this first meeting? That, that was so completely remote. Um, it, here's the thing, like Giorgio had a concept and that concept was called Zoo, right? Z-U. It was an overarching type of, I guess, idea that he was going to um, brand. And obviously this is long before people are thinking of branding stuff outside of, you know, commodities. He was gonna brand everything with this name Zoo. That's why we became the Zoo Band. We were his house band, so Zoo Band, right? And where he lived, we called it the Zoo House. It was the Zoo House. Um, and he was basically angling to create like a media empire. Like he had plans made up to convert uh, the building into kind of like a cafe type um, I can't remember. He showed me plans for it at one point. It was the zoo time space something or other. You know, I think he saw it as I think what he wanted to do with it was create kind of a um, almost like a cafe, like a, a, a like a, a cafe where artists would go, like in the you know in in Paris and the like Belle Epoque type stuff. You know, where people would sort of like meet and and, and share ideas and sort of cross pollinate which is very much happening in New York anyhow, but I think he wanted to create sort of like a nexus or a center for that kind of thing, which was very, very, it, that was so incredibly forward thinking. I mean, like people have really started to do that kind of thing only within the last five or 10 years. I mean, it's been done, it's been done over time, but not on a business level the way I think he, I don't think he even saw it really as a business. I think he saw it more as kind of like a, you know, creating a center you know, and he's making money off coffees and stuff like that. <laughs> you know, not 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 necessarily renting space to creatives, which has been which is what that idea really turned into. But back then, of course, everyone wasn't thinking in terms of monetization. They they were thinking more in terms of like the, the fun of it was really in the the cross pollination, like sharing creativity, like making it go further. And also being there at ground zero. I think he liked that very much. He really enjoyed being privy to all that and kind of being sort of the grease that helped the wheels go, you know. Right. But it was this whole overarching thing. And the Zoo Mana Festival, Mana Festival was just another offshoot of that. Right. You know, but there hadn't been any conversation about that at all until it really started to get underway. I see. So I guess other people were probably answering this ad besides, besides you and Fred, and, uh, and eventually you bring in Martin. Um, did you meet any of these other people? The only people who we met were the people who wound up being in the zoo band. <laughs> <laughs> um, at that point, it was Fred, myself, Bill, and Cliff. And eventually a guy named Dennis Weiss, who played synthesizer as well and sang. Right. All right, let me uh, bring up another picture for you. Here's, a, here's a poster from the, uh, from the Zoo Mana Festival. Oh which... yeah, I got a couple of those lying around. Oh, you still have them? <laughs> Hell yeah. So this happens on this a- my first eight. show, come on, man. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, that's... A man never forgets his first. Apparently, this show was so uh, fantastic that the people who went, not only are they still talking about it today, but many of them, or some of them anyway, refer to it as a life-changing experience. Um, someone that I know in the Bay Area, um, Mark Weinstein, who is one of the co-founders and owner of uh, Amoeba Records, he oh, was, no, really? He was there Whoa. In, the, in the audience, and uh, I believe he posted <laughs> on Facebook that it was a life-changing experience for him, and, and he's not <sighs> the only one. So, um, okay, let's look at the, not the entire list here, but I want to see where, he, where, you, where your name is as we uh, scroll down here a little bit. So here we have, uh, there's several uh, uh, mentions. Oh, I forgot. We, we were mentioned as New York Gong on there. On this, yes, for sure. Holy cow. 
Yeah. All right. Fact, well. More than once. New York Kong is mentioned like several times in this okay. list here. Well, but it was kind of honestly though, that wasn't really like there wasn't a proper New York Kong band. I know this goes back and forth, but it was more like it was more like we were an affiliate of a motorcycle club. It's like Hell's <laughs> Angels Sacramento. It wasn't like New York Gong the band. It's like we were the the New York affiliate of Gong. You see what I mean? Like we, <laughs> Uh, I think that puts it into better perspective. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, oh, yeah. So here you, you, you're mentioned with uh, Dennis Weiss. Yeah. Tell me who he is. I, I'm not familiar with him. Um, he, he, I can't remember when he was in the band with us. Um, obviously, it was through the time that we played this show. But he, you know, he... He actually, he had a cat synthesizer, if I'm not mistaken. So he had, his instrument was a couple of steps up from mine. Um, but yeah, I mean, he, he had some songs that he wrote and uh, we performed them at that show. And, you know, we'd written a bunch of stuff together. And, you know, he was, he was the, he was the fifth member of Zoo Band for a little while. Uh-huh. Lovely guy. Yeah. And uh, so you've mentioned Cliff Culturary. Um, how did he, do you know how he got involved with, with this uh, crew here? Well, I mean, Cliff was sort of like an all around man about town type guy. Uh, and he was, you know, he was, he was a pretty good guitarist actually. He knew of all the artists that, that were on that flyer that Bill had made, because Bill was actually the guy who made the flyer. And he and his girlfriend, Jane, had gone all over, you know, lower Manhattan, like pasted, pla pasting them up on, on, you know, walls and stuff late at night. <laughs> and, um, you know, I think Cliff was intrigued as well. I'm sure that, that Laswell had probably gone into Pantasia at some point and they knew each other and had been talking. Uh -huh. um, but Cliff responded to that and, you know, he was just, he was a great, I guess, connection to the downtown music scene because he knew everybody. Like, it's funny, I just got done reading this book about Jerry Nolan, the drummer from the New York Dolls and the Heartbreakers. And, um, you know, I remember like walking around down, kicking it downtown and I saw Cliff like hanging out, you know, talking in the street with Jerry Nolan. I was like, oh shit. <laughs> Huh. You know, he knew he knew all those guys. Like it was, he he was just sort of Mister Downtown. He lived on East Third Street, like on the eight that the Hell's Angels block. Speaking uh -huh. of the Angels, um, you know, so he was he was pretty dialed into that whole scene. Right. So between the time you have this first meeting at the Zoo House and the Zoo Manifestival actually happens. Um, how much playing are you guys doing together? Um, to be perfectly honest, I don't, I don't recall. Um, I mean, I think that we were getting together fairly regularly at that point. Like, I just remember us coming away from meeting Laswell going like, well, I mean, because he wasn't like anyone we'd ever encountered before. You know, I mean, for, for one thing, he was older. You know, he was older than me by five years. And he continues to be older than me by five years, too, <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's funny how those things never change. Yeah. Um, but he, you know, he, he just had kind of like this, this vibe about him. Like he seemed worldlier and kind of like, sort of like, huh. this, very, this very sort of like powerful, commanding presence. You know, and then he picked up a bass guitar and, and, you know, Fred and I were kind of like, what did he just do? What was that? Like, <laughs> I mean, we'd seen bass players, but we'd never seen anyone who could play like that, you know? Right. So we were both like, oh, man, if we could, if we could, like, be in a band with this guy. So when it, it all fell together really fast, we are like, whoa, okay, I guess we're in a band then. This is awesome. You know, and we just sort of got down to it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the, the, uh, Zoo Mana Festival happens, and there must have been quite a buildup because this is a 12 hour long music festival. 
said 12 wow. hours, but it was actually 14, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's right. There, it, it did go a little <laughs> overtime. A little overtime, and we get to find out all about it. <laughs> um, um, can, can, can you, do you remember much about that day? Oh, man. I mean, it's like the prom when you're in sixth grade. Like, you're just kind of like in a daze. Like, what the hell? You know, like it was sensory, a lot of it was sensory overload for me. I just sort of remember the time in vignettes. Um, I remember seeing Alan uh, Ginsberg coming out on stage. You know, I mean, back then, like the significance of Alan Ginsberg for me was kind of like old wrinkly guy, you know. And, you know, I have no idea what I'm watching. And he proceeds to do like a new piece of poetry which is some of the worst drivel I'd ever heard in my life. <laughs> Meanwhile, some other guy comes on stage and does a recitation of part of Howl, which of course is Ginsburg's tour de force. And we're all kind of like, that's amazing. <laughs> like it was incredible. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, we saw all these like downtown artists who like, you know, no one thought anything of, of it at all. You know, like, like theoretical girls and, you know, Jeffrey Lone, I think his name was, and obviously Glenn Bronca and all those, you know, Reese Chatham, you know. You knew about them already? Well, I'd heard about them. And then I saw it, I was kind of like, this is kind of noisy, rackety type, you know, uh -huh. like I just wasn't feeling it. Uh -huh. You know, but I'm like, you know, 18 years old at this point. Like it just, it didn't register. Like late, I... I only got into Glenn Bronco like much later on and I went back to all of his stuff. I just started listening to it. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, yeah. but I, I mean, I had the same issue with contemporary art. Like I used to look at it and go, it looks like someone drew the paint up on it. One day I was looking at a painting and I was like, oh shit, this is incredible. What have I been, you know, your perspective, your perspective on things can change in an instant and all of a sudden you see what's what's there what you've been missing the whole time yeah especially when you're 17 18 i mean that's just when you're becoming aware of this stuff you don't know shit back then so yeah. like <laughs> you know i i just remember all this stuff going on and it's kind of like blur and obviously they had like a million people in the village you can see in only 12 hours to pull the whole thing off and it wasn't yeah, yeah, like they, the theater. What the? How big is this theater that that it's happening in? It was. I don't remember how big it was. It used to be a movie theater, and before then, actually, it got its start as part of the um, the Yiddish community downtown. Like it had been sort of like a Yiddish cultural theater where people would put on Yiddish plays and you know Yiddish, I guess, musical events and things like that. Um, I think it was like, 50, like a thousand, fifteen hundred seater. I'm not sure. Yeah, you I've know, heard it range between five hundred and a thousand mostly. I don't but. think it was five hundred. Well, I don't know. I, you know, like it's and it, and it was know, packed. Or it was sold out. This I don't recall. I think it was close to sold out. I don't think like the whole place was was chock full of people. Uh -huh. I mean, there were certainly enough people to watch the whole thing to, to watch the whole thing go off. And did you, you know, hang out for the whole 12 to 14 hours? Pretty much. I mean, I was kind of, I was definitely running on whatever energy was going on around me. So, and that was pretty substantial. You know, it was very exciting. Uh -huh. All right. I you have know. a, I have another picture here. Um, maybe it will jog your memory about. This is the stage and. Uh, this oh, get is, out of town. Now, I've heard. Oh, crap. Here's Jerry Lindahl's um, Buchla's. Oh, gosh, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> oh, man. I'll never thank you for jogging my memory on that. That was one of the most beautiful expositions of modular synth playing I have ever experienced in my life. I, that was amazing. If I blow that up, can you see oh, it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know whose Putney's those were, though. I don't so know. I was told this picture was taken the night before of the actual event. Could be. I mean, that looks pretty. It was a mess. 
stands to reason. I guess that was part of the get them on, get them off type thing. <laughs> yeah. That's a great picture, though. That, wow, that's crazy. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Could be. I think I was on that stage for a minute or two. <laughs> well, it seems like the, the, the this was the initial setup. It must have changed a lot over the course of the 12-hour evening. Uh Apparently, Martin was involved with helping people move stuff on and off the stage, including a Fred Frith's table of of implements that he was using for his guitars. So, yeah. here, here's a picture of uh, uh, some of the performers. Somebody told me they oh, thought yeah. th this photo might be a montage. What do you think? Um, that's Probably not a montage. Actually, I don't. Hold on a sec. You want me to blow it up a little? Yeah, maybe. If uh, we go from left to right here, you can. There's an ARP twenty six hundred. There's a twenty six hundred, baby. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Do you know any of these people? Um, looks like Chris Cutler in the background. Yeah, um, on the right there on drums. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember. I mean, I'm off in the back somewhere, I think, on the left. Um, obviously, David Allen is right there on the far right. Um, that's Laswell with the beret and the jumpsuit. And I think the... Uh, And is that is that Jilly Smythe? Uh, I think it. I think it might be. Yeah, I'm not gonna. The, wait, is that Cutler back there on the drums? Hold on a sec. I'm getting confused here. I, that looks more like Chris Cutler playing drums there. Oh and yeah, this is uh, Paul. That's Sears. Fred. This oh, that's is Paul Sears. Sears. Did Paul Sears play drums with us? He played drums. Well, he played with uh, uh, the Muffins, of course. Yeah. So that's why somebody thinks this might be a, a montage. Uh, I'm going to have to plead the fifth on this one. I don't know. Because Paul Sears, <laughs> you know, he was also doing live sound for this whole event, except when the muffins played, of course. Yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. I mean, now that I'm looking at it, that actually looked like me back there in that picture. <laughs> so I don't know. This is Dennis. I think that's Dennis right between this guy with the guitar and Jilly. Um, I think that's Dennis. And the rest of it, your guess is as good as mine. It's a nice picture, the, uh, the clarity of it and all. It's, um, yeah. There's no, several, there's... Of, there's several um, pictures like this at different times of the evening, I'm trying to get a hold of. I think Paul Sears has several. Do you have any uh, any pictures from this time? I've got about like two or three shots um, from the show. That's a friend of mine was there. She took some pictures and gave them to me. I would like to see them if you don't mind sometime. <laughs> sure. It's a walk down memory lane. So there was a... <laughs> There was a special event at the show that was a uh, panel discussion. Oh, yeah. Tell me about this. The panel. Well, I only remember the... Uh, so this is I some, only remember this is some music critics? Yeah. Uh, I only remember Chris, Michael Bloom, who's right in the center, I think. And Robert Criscow, who's off to the left, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, the note here uh, kind of identifies the people. And Oh, Cliff was up there too, huh? So do you remember yeah. how this panel discussion went? Um, it was basically a bunch of people just like, <laughs> giving their opinions about about progressive music and stuff like that and you know i mean <sighs> was there audience participation yeah there was a lot of yelling and shouting from time to time um i think chris got made a comment about 
how um, about he how he disliked a lot of that music and I can't remember. He made some comment about um, he wouldn't buy any of this music and people started yelling at him and he said, because they give it to me or something like that, as if it was some kind of caveat. <laughs> and then um, the, I think the quote of the night came from Chris Cutler. And for months after this, all of us just kept imitating Chris and this comment that he made. I'll never forget as long as, as I live. He said, there's too much bloody music and it's all bad like that. <laughs> <laughs> that to me, it summed up everything and was the quote of the night. I see. There's also a, a picture of uh, David Allen standing in front of the panel, putting uh, masking tape over his mouth. Well, that's just the sort of thing David would probably get up to, I think. <laughs> so at this event, um, you play with the zoo band, right? Yeah. Did you also play with uh, David Allen's band? That's right, yeah. Okay, anybody else? Um, I'm trying to remember. I might have been with Yashko Stafra, but I don't remember. I don't remember. So, that was it. Um, so there is a uh, recording of this event uh, that is, exists on the internet now. Um, um, Giorgio Gomelski had the whole evening pretty much recorded with plans of uh, apparently releasing it on Zoo Records um, because uh, Paul Sears has uh, some images of the program that was handed out. And the last page of the program was basically a, an announcement by Zoo Records to look for, yeah, yeah to look for the uh, recording of the uh, Zoo Festival. I'm that, pretty sure I got a copy of that program too, actually. Oh, uh, really? If you so, Paul is having trouble finding his complete program. If you could find it, that would be fantastic. Just li little, booklet yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, I got that someplace. Excellent. Well, I will. Uh, I will be following up with you about that. Um, As you wish. The, uh, so the evening got recorded. Gomelski plans to release it. Like a lot of Gomelski plans, that, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, and the, the tapes end up in boxes. Or Actually, nobody really knows what happened to them. Until Gomelski dies in 2016. And... Uh, his place is being cleared out and most of the stuff is being thrown away. And Dave Soldier and, and some people that he knows happened to see this box with these tapes in it and uh, essentially rescued them. And Dave Soldier has digitized um, all that music from the Zoo Festival and it's on a Giorgio Gomelski uh, tribute website now. I think I sent you the link to that. I don't know yes, if you, you did. Did you have a chance to look at that? I'm, <laughs> I, I think it'll be years before I can actually have, have a listen to that. Uh, I'm pretty. Right. But it also right includes now, the panel okay. discussion. <laughs> so that'd um, be funny. But, but yeah, eventually I think you're, you'll probably find your way there and listen to it. It's for me, uh, I've heard, I haven't heard the whole thing yet, but uh, just hearing the, there's a lot of interaction between the audience and the and the bands or whoever or people who are announcing the bands, and that kind of ambiance gives you a pretty good feeling for what the event was like. Maybe more so than some of these pictures that I'm showing, which don't really show the audience at all. Mm -hmm. um, so, I would I would encourage anybody who uh, is, is interested, if especially if you were there. Go listen to these, and if you weren't there, go listen to these because it's uh, <laughs> it's an amazing document. Well, before we leave uh, the zoo festival, I wanted to get your opinion on what you thought uh, the impact of that festival was on the music scene in New York at that time. Um. I would say 
probably about this. Not much, huh? Yeah. It was an exciting night for all of us, I think. Uh, certainly for me. Um, it was a lot of fun, but I didn't hear many people talking about it after that. Like we saw kind of like a few tepid write-ups in local papers like Soho Weekly News and the Village Voice, but the undertone of it pertained mainly to prog rock. And this is music that, you know, again, it was underground for a reason at this point in time. You know, if you were into happening music, you like punk rock, you know, you like going into clubs. This is not the music that you would walk into, you know, CBGBs to listen to. It's a whole different thing. You know, a lot of people that were in that audience were local, but a lot of them had come from out of town, you know, from around the country. Because this was kind of, this was like ground zero for artists that they thought would, they'd given up hope that would ever come to this country at all. You know, it's yeah. an, I'm not going to miss this type thing, but I'm the only person in my entire city who knows what this is. All right. Right. You so, know, okay. So, so maybe as far as attracting a bigger audience, it didn't have such a big impact. But as part of Gomelsky's vision, specifically at this time, to bring the European avant garde to America and get them to mix, how, do, how successful do you think it was at that? Uh, it was a total success. I mean, Giorgio got to see firsthand. I mean, I think he already had a sense of this, but he realized that there was a potential market to be plumbed uh, of people who, and it wasn't necessarily because it was such a large audience, it was because they were rabid, that they would probably, you know, that they would climb over one another to get to an event that had artists like these. And he knew that you could set up shows in certain places. You know, I guess he figured in many cases, college towns, although some of these shows were in places that were kind of like baffling in terms of like, why would you do a show? Like, I, I think there were a couple of bars here and there. I think we okay, so we're not, places. now we're talking about the, uh, uh, the New York gong on the road, right? Yeah, except we weren't New York gong back then. I mean, it was, we were still the zoo band. Yeah. You know? Yeah, the headline. I don't think, we, were, I don't think was, we became New York Gong properly until that record. Oh, right. Yeah. Af, after this North American tour, you go record what becomes the first material recordings, and David Allen records About Time, the New York Gong album. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit here. The festival has happened. Um, David Allen is, has got a band together now, and uh, Giorgio wants to take it on the road. Here they are. So you guys get a, a bus. This is essentially, it's a school bus, right? Not a snow essentially about it. It was <laughs> full on school bus. But you, but you modified it uh, for touring somewhat. <laughs> yep. It was modified. Um, a section of the rear seats had been pulled out and uh, in their place. I can't remember who it was exactly. I think it may have been Jilly's boyfriend, Harry. Uh, so, someone who was very good with, uh, who, who was good with uh, um, woodworking. <laughs> uh -huh. he, uh, he built a combination loft bed and um, I guess gear storage. So... Let me show There's you the next, the next picture here, because this shows the uh, bus a little yeah, bit. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. And so there was a, a loft bed for sleeping. And underneath that was, was all the gear storage. Right. And <laughs> if I zoom, uh, my attention is drawn towards all the graffiti, of course. <laughs> yeah. Was that done by you guys uh, on the road? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah. There's another, there's, there's another thing about this photo that I need to ask you a question about. Um, okay. 
I interviewed, uh, so so I guess let's just run down who these people are. On the left, that's Fred, right? Fred Marr. Yeah. And then Bill Bacon. Cliff. Or no, Chris, Chris, uh, Coltr uh, Cliff Coltrary, right? Yeah. And then Bill Bacon. Then David Allen. And this picture of Bill Laswell, I think, is the only picture I've seen where he's actually smiling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he didn't pride himself on being particularly smiley. <laughs> no, he always seemed very serious. Um, I was going to ask you about that, uh, working with him. Was he always a, a really serious guy or did, were there any lighthearted moments? Um, I wouldn't say that there were lighthearted moments with Bill. Um, Bill. Bill derived a tremendous amount of pleasure out of making other feel, people feel incredibly uncomfortable. So oh. when he... When he, when he was enjoying himself, it was usually at someone else's expense. <laughs> I see. That's when you would see him smile. Um, there wasn't anything lighthearted there, though. Uh-huh. Okay. I wonder at whose expense uh, we have in this picture. I uh, don't know, but at least everyone else is smiling, so it looks like we're all in on the joke. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then, of course, that's you with, uh, with your eyes closed. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Don Davis, who played sax on this tour. That's right. Yeah. And what stands out about Don in this photo is he's dressed in all white. Yep. And I'm I noticing just... that. Pardon me? I was noticing that as well. <laughs> Do you remember him being like that? Um, I don't think I really paid attention to that, to tell you the truth. Yeah, the rest of you guys are in black. Pretty much. Well, we were like, you know, we were trying to be badasses, you know, oh, like right. wearing yeah, like that, leather jackets and fatigues and stuff like that, you know, that, or like the jacket with like the turned up collar. That's the way you did it back then. Don was a right. hippie. Right. And uh, Martin B. And a very about... lovely person, by the way, I, I, I must add. <laughs> Martin very pleasant about, to be around. Martin talked about wearing camouflage and, you know, army fatigues and stuff to, because New York, where you guys lived in New York, was so rough, you had to put on a tough image all the time. It wasn't a tough image. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't that it was rough. That's a bunch of horse shit. It wasn't about that. Everyone projected this image of trying to be tough. You know, it's kind of like I'm a badass. It wasn't yeah. like anyone walking down the street was going to throw a punch at your head. It wasn't like that at all. You know, we all wanted, it, it was all, basically everyone was fronting. I see. If you want me to be perfectly honest about it, like the whole, the leather jacket stuff, it was kind of like, you know, no one's in a motorcycle gang around here. No one I knew even rode a motorcycle. So why the <laughs> motorcycle jacket? It's badass stuff. Right. That's all. Right. Well, the, the non-badass in the picture is Don Davis, who's all in white. I and... loved him for that. I love him. In, in that picture, I love him for that. Yeah. And... I've seen, uh, there's a great, uh, well, great, there's a, a Super 8, I'm sure it was shot on Super 8, uh, of the L.A. show of uh, Gong. And uh, Don Davis is obviously playing sax, and he's still dressed all in white on stage. I assume that he was always dressed all in white when he performed. Well, I can't speak to that. All right, um, well, here, but... you can speak to this. Uh huh. After this tour, you guys go and record, and uh, you ask Don to come in to play on one song. What is the name of that song? White Man. There you go. Why was that song called White Man? And that's the only song Don Davis plays on. <clears throat> This is like looking for, this is like playing, <laughs> trying to play Dark Side of the Moon backwards and looking for like the, and looking for the, you know, like weird messages. I don't know. know or dropping, all, you know, dropping a whole bunch of acid <laughs> and watching Dark Side of the Moon and starting hey, like the Wizard of Oz. and you, seeing how You guys goes. had it's just been like on a that. two month tour together and he's dressed in white the whole time. It's a coincidence no. that you go into the studio and invite him to play on the song called white man it wasn't about don <laughs> that's what he said <laughs> all right if he said that i'm going along with it because i don't want to contradict don it's don not about don. That's, that's, what he, that's what he said right so
Anyway. Yeah. I don't remember it like that, but we're talking about stuff that happened over 40 years ago. Well, yeah, right. over 40 years ago. So, <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh oh, that yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't move around so good like I used to. You're touring on this bus for about two months together. Um, I assume this is your first time on the road with a band, right? Mm hmm. Um, it's probably also your first time visiting many of these parts of, uh, of uh, North America, right? It was, yeah. So what was your impression of, uh, and any stories from any of these towns that, uh, that stand out to you? Uh, I mean, I know it was I, 40 I, years ago. Yeah, I have to rack my brains pretty hard, but like it was, you know, it's funny because I had a cassette tape that was just recordings that I made of us on the bus um, and all the like crazy shit that people got into, like, and all the really out there conversations people were having. Um, when we played in California, I don't remember that, did we play at the shrine? We played at some like auditorium. Like a larger, it, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a, like a dive bar or anything like that. Like, you know, it wasn't like playing at a college. I don't think it was a college campus. Shit, I don't remember where it was, but I um, think it was. I I got the itinerary. <laughs> okay, then you can you can straighten me out. Uh, Los Angeles. Uh, hmm. I don't know. They don't list the venue, unfortunately. But I know people who were there. They would know the venue. I'll, I'll... Yeah. It was co-sponsored, I think, by these people who had a record company called All Ears Records, if I'm not mistaken. And um, at the end of the night, like, whoever was supposed to pay us kind of skipped out. <laughs> and we somehow found out where this guy lived. And we all wound up at his apartment and just congregated in his house. And we're like, uh, you know, I actually had it. I had the cassette running for that. That was interesting. I don't have this cassette anymore, but like, it was pretty, it was pretty uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, you know, cause we were basically sitting in this guy's house waiting until sun up so he could go to the bank and give us our money. All right. Um, and there was another time where uh, one of the, uh, actually uh, Jilly's boyfriend, Harry, started freaking out over money or something like that, um, which everyone inevitably did. And we had a tour manager who was uh, someone who, uh, I think Gamalski knew, whose name was Georges Leton. Um, and his, basically every day when you'd walk towards him, I think he'd gotten so used to people asking for money. All you'd have to do is walk in his direction. You'd go, I have no money like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> so Harry, I think is trying to get more money or something like that. Like he just is losing, he, he's just like losing his shit on this guy. And George is going to Harry, 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 you have to choice. You have to choice. You know, and we'd all heard this conversation. So for like months, even years after this, you know, Laswell and me and everyone else would walk around going, you have to choice. <laughs> it was one of those things. Um, but like, I can't remember. I think there, there might've been like a stabbing at one of these shows. Like it was like, there was some high drama stuff. And this bus was like held together with spit and duct tape. And it was breaking down all the time. Um, were you sleeping we on the bus? Well, that's what the loft was for. But I mean, everybody? Hell no. <laughs> the loft was reserved for the zoo band. I see. <laughs> and no one else was allowed up there at all. Well, Nobody. where did the others sleep? In the seats. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and if you're a 40-ish, like, um, aging like hippie with no muscle tone at all and you have to sit upright in like a bus like that 
which obviously was not designed for people to be sitting in. You know, you're going to get awfully cranky. Yeah. And everyone was like, come on, come on, seriously. And we're like, <laughs> they actually tried to storm us one time. <laughs> like we had a full on mutiny take place on the bus. It was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> so was the, was there a lot of tension building up then over the course of these two months? Um, I think the whole time we were on the tour, it was kind of tense. Hmm. You know, I mean, it was like, it was exciting. You know, I mean, for, for me and for Fred and, you know, everyone else who'd never been on the road, we were kind of like, <laughs> you know, like, wow, what's this? What's that? What's that? What's that? Oh, my God. You know, it was just new sites, new experiences. Sure. But, you know, it was, it, it, it could get uncomfortable at times on the yeah. bus. You know, as you could imagine, I mean, you're talking about like a large group of people who are just never apart from each other for this long period of time, driving back and forth across the United States. What could go wrong on this bus that's like, you know, dying on a, on a pretty regular basis. Right, but you, uh, but then uh, you get to play together, and you get to do it a lot, and uh, I would imagine that that must have built up some kind of musical camaraderie amongst you guys. And the and the more you played together, well, you tell me. How did I assume it got better? <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know if it worked quite that way. I mean, it was. It was a pretty, I never really got that vibe from it, you know? I mean, it was fun, but after a while, it, it was just kind of, uh. <laughs> hmm. See, the thing is, is that on that tour, I discovered that, um, and over time, I discovered that that just wasn't the kind of life that I really wanted to lead. Like, right. I just wasn't interested in that. Playing live to me was kind of like something that you had to do. Uh-huh. <laughs> if you wanted to if you wanted to make music and be in a band and stuff like that. So I was like, all right, well, this is medicine I'm going to have to take. So, you know, it must be. But it just wasn't really my thing. I mean, that's not to say that other people had it, you know, that other people had the same experience. I'm sure they didn't. Right. You know, but for me it wasn't that way. To me, the, the whole the over the overriding experience of being on that bus, like driving through death valley um you know at like two in the morning in the, you know it's like 20 degrees and we're all in this bus like <laughs> like that just shivering right getting violently ill you know and finally i remember crashing and i had all my clothes on <laughs> because i was so cold yeah and we had like one blanket up there or something like that and i just remember waking up bathed like literally swimming in a pool of my own sweat because yeah. it was you know, the sun was at, we're still in Death Valley, and hey, it's all, all, it's all of a sudden it's like 90 degrees, <laughs> and we're in this bus, and the, the roof of the bus is like that far away, <laughs> and you're getting yeah. baked, you know, it's like being in a frying pan, so yeah. it, was a, it was a really, it was a very intense experience, you know, but it was perfect for, you know, a, a kid who's like 18, 19 years old, and never done that before, it was amazing. Right. Well, you 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 managed to survive the tour. Uh, I think so. <laughs> you get back to uh, New York, and uh, and there's talk of you know recording like pretty soon. Um, the, uh, the the this is '79. We're talking about the tour went from a April, May, and part of June, and. I think you end up in the studio in July, right? Something like that. I'll, I'll uh, check that later. But I guess uh, describe for me what's the preparation or what's the talk about before you go into the studio? I mean, what's the prep before you go record? Um, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't recall any of that. I mean, hmm. this is music that we had composed and I think we were performing in, uh, I don't remember if we were doing gigs before that. Um, I think we did like one or two gigs 
because I have a flyer somewhere that says Zuban on it. And it's like for, it's for Hurrah or, you know, one of these places downtown. I really don't recall. Um, but, you know, we'd written, we'd written these songs and we were like, okay, you know, it's going to be these four. And we just, that was it. We so you kind of, you'd honed those songs on the road, essentially. Uh, someplace. I don't know if we, I don't recall if those songs were actually songs that we were playing when we were on tour, when we went on that particular tour. So there it is. Um, Here it is. And uh, these are the first recordings by Material. So at what point do you go from calling yourself Zoo Band to Material? Well, we were the zoo band up till the time that we separated from Gamalski. Um, zoo band was his, you know, zoo obviously was was his thing. So we had to distinguish, we had to separate ourselves. We had to distinguish ourselves from that. And uh, in keeping with our new, uh, with our makeover and uh, moving, moving, out from under his, I guess, in premature, we just kind of rechristened ourselves. And but, our, there was like a week, two, three week, two or three week period where we were constantly coming up with names for, you know, for what we would be, you know, just trying to figure out what we were going to call our band. Right. But, but during this recording, um, Gomelski is producing this. That's right, yeah. So we so were still the zoo band when we recorded it, though. Oh, I see. Okay, so yeah. it's after the material recording. is the afterthought, right? So between recording and releasing, you have this everything separation. changed. Pardon me? Yeah, everything changed. I mean, the record was basically. You'll notice that it it was released on Zoo Records. That right. was kind of our our parting gift to Gamelski because he was like he was basically. He was basically like, look, you know, you guys started here. You wouldn't have been able to do this without me, you know, uh, excuse me. And you guys owe me. I mean, we didn't have any um, contracts or anything like that. There wasn't anything where he could have taken us to court. And besides, I don't think that he had the bankroll to be able to do anything like that. But at that point, it was just it was kind of like an okay if we're going to make a break of this then we should probably do this the right way so he was he got the masters to put out on his on his label and it's one of the only things that he put out on his label i think there weren't very many zoo records releases i didn't even know that there were any others yeah maybe not i i don't think so man yeah i mean like with a, as you said before like with a lot of stuff that giorgio envisioned he wasn't able to follow through with, you know, some, you know, a lot of his grander designs, which is a shame because like some of them were really, really forward thinking. I mean, they, he was many, many years ahead of his time in certain respects, you know, but this was definitely one of those things. Right. So the other uh, thing about this recording that really caught my attention was uh, not only is it produced by Giorgio Gomelski, and I want to talk to you about the in-studio stuff that you were doing uh, with him at the time, but this is recorded, uh, or the engineer, one of the engineering credits goes to Eddie Offord, who is at this point, the famous prog rock engineer who was responsible for <laughs> some of the greatest classic prog albums of all time, released by, yes, and Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Yeah. Before you got into the studio, had you heard that Eddie Offord was going to be the engineer? Yeah, I did. And I mean, I guess it registered with me because I was familiar with his name on some of those records, but it kind of it kind of did and it kind of didn't. I mean, it was, I mean, it was almost like it was such a different world because he came from a world of like 
fans screaming in large arenas and stuff like that and you know sold out rock shows and you know it, it just he was almost like a being from another planet like we're going to be working with eddie offered it was kind of it was a little too much i guess to kind of even put into into any kind of pers like any kind of perspective that i could that i could contain and I just remember looking through the window of the studio when we showed up at RSO, which was Levon Helm's place. Right, up like in they, Woodstock, yeah. Yeah, they'd given him like a permanent residency up there or something like that, you know, just to kind of bring business in and kind of like, you know, keep the place running. I just remember looking through the windows and seeing his console in there because it was set up as a proper mixing console. And I was kind of like, what is that? Like, it's just... It was big and it had all these controls on it. And I think I'd mentioned to you that it had joystick controllers on each channel because it was because they I, I'm pretty sure they were traveling with a quad um, monitoring system. So, I mean, you're able to pan in like a quad space with each individual ch channel. And it was it was just like it, it was it felt to me kind of like we were visit we we'd gotten in a rocket ship and we we're visiting like a, a an advanced alien civilization it was just <laughs> it, it was just mind blowing to be around that you know well, so was that your first it didn't time register in a way was that your first time in a professional recording studio um it was my first time recording in a professional recording studio i've been in a recording studio once before but it was once again the experience was kind of i didn't understand what i was looking at uh-huh yeah so uh, can you describe a little bit about recording these songs and the role that Gomelsky played as producer um to tell you the truth my memory is pretty sketchy as far as that goes the only thing that I really recall about those sessions was that at the end of it Giorgio made these fantastic meatballs <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that that could be important <laughs> that well it certainly it, it made the whole thing worthwhile my recollection was that there was a certain that his involvement was more of a um kind of he, he was more of like a vibe master type guy like he was sort of about getting the party going so to speak and everyone kind of like getting excited i mean his thing he used to one of his favorite things is you've got to get into the spirit of it, fellows, like that. <laughs> <laughs> fellows, fellows, like that. <laughs> and in his <laughs> in in his Russian inflected English, um, he he was all about the vibe. I don't right. really recall him looking over Eddie's shoulder and saying, "Hey, could you add a little bit more?" Like he had a little bit more hundred k on that or hundred hertz <laughs> on that kick drum. You know, <laughs> or, hey, I don't like that mic. Could you switch it out for like a 421 or something like that? <laughs> no, I don't. Yeah, I don't think he was more about about the uh, performance than he was, I think, about any technical aspects about the sound. Yeah, I don't even think that he I don't think that he really understood aspects of the performance, to tell you the truth. I mean, I, I don't really recall that he he was following like specific like note patterns or anything like that. It was, I think it was all about the vibe for him. Right. And just well, about how things felt like if this performance felt right. Uh, and I don't recall him complaining about anything too much. So I think we did okay in his, uh, in his eyes. Don Davis had a great recollection of uh, while Don is recording his part, Gomelski comes up to him and starts gesticulating wildly, trying to egg, egg him on in some way. Do you remember that? <laughs> I'm afraid I don't. Uh -huh. <laughs> Obviously, he didn't do that to you. <laughs> um, I don't. I don't recall. No, I think the only gesturing that he may have done toward me would have been kind of like I'm about to hit you type thing. <laughs> Did he have a nickname for you? No. He didn't have a nickname for me. Um, everyone else had nicknames for me. Um, I think it, <laughs> do, you remember, do you remember any of them? Um, one was the Baron. Um, 
See, one of the things about all that graffiti on the back of the bus was that like everyone was like being made fun of. Uh -huh. Like that had a, um, like if someone wanted to mess around, with, if people wanted to mess around with you, they'd put like nicknames up, they'd put your nickname up on the bus or just kind of, I mean, Martin, for example, was Young Smartin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he related that. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I mean, and he, he was very smart, you know, he, he, he basically had an answer for everything and he, he could speak three languages, which made him an, him an anomaly amongst like, uh, you know, uh, the New Yorkers. Right. Um, me, I remember the Baron, I remember um, throbbing Beinhorn or throbbing von Krafthausen or something like that. <laughs> um, you know, because that was kind of like an amalgam of all the different musical artists that I, that I liked. Um, and I'm trying to remember if I, I don't think I can recall any other ones, but I'm sure that there had to be some. But yeah, yeah I mean, everyone, everyone got a nickname except Laswell. Because <laughs> <laughs> no one wanted to mess with him. Right. <laughs> yeah. After you record this, uh, the, this first EP with uh, the now named Material Band, and you release it. You go on to do uh, um, more recording uh, with material. And there's one photo from that time that <clears throat> I wanted to show you. Maybe you, I, it looks like a promo photo. Oh, that one. You can tell me, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's after the time that, uh, it's funny, I got one of those too. Um, that was a, that was after material stopped being a band and was more of a production team like we weren't really we we made we made one or two records under the name material but it wasn't uh it wasn't really a band anymore so what was the purpose of this photo um we were artists on uh, Electra Records. I believe that was the promo photo for Electra. So Bill seems to be holding out a dollar bill. So, someone uh, speculated this had something to do with the One Down album. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it, it was, I, I think there was an, there was an interest I think from like I think Bill kind of related that whole thing to the idea of <clears throat> R and B music and how money and dollar bills got referred to in R and B. I mean that's a lot of where he kind of he sort of like <clears throat> would kind of recycle a lot of stuff from, like the idea of one down. Obviously, is referring to a, a dollar bill. Um, excuse me. And um, I guess it was kind of, I don't know. I mean, at this stage, I could speculate all kinds of stuff. I mean, it was, it was sort of like a, you know, like a badass kind of thing to do. It was, it was sort of a... <clears throat> do you remember the location? Uh, no, not exactly. How about that jacket you're wearing? Oh, <laughs> oh, something I wish I'd never given up. I don't know what happened to it, actually. That's an original Kansai Yamamoto. Ah. Yeah, people want a lot of money for those on eBay now. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um, yeah, no, I love that thing. I mean, you know, look at us. We're like a pair of stylish guys, like in our duds and things like that, hanging out in this like cafe with a shortwave radio on the table. He's holding a dollar bill out with that hat on, you know, I mean, we're like, you know, yeah. we're like, we're like studs in, in Manhattan trying to like, it's, it, it's, there's a lot of fronting going on there. Yeah. So, so at this point, you're, uh, you and Laswell are, are this production team, right? That's right, yeah. And uh, 
you were both going to go off to uh, careers as uh, record producers, and is and you both actually kind of hit the big time right away with the Herbie Hancock record. Mm -hmm. um, and I assume this picture is kind of around that time. This is before that. About I'm going to say this is about, this is probably like a year and a half, two years before. Oh, okay. Quite a bit. I think this might have been from 81. We worked with Herbie in 83, so. All right. I'm pretty sure this is around the time that we worked with Nona Hendrix, actually. Pretty sure. All right. So, as I was saying, uh, you guys go on to bigger and better things. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight, of course, except for that Herbie Hancock thing, which kind of did. Um, <laughs> no one saw that coming. No. Um, but, I mean, the stuff that you've done in your career has been pretty amazing uh, for, uh, as far as producing records goes. Looking back on it now, what would you say this experience so early on in your career with somebody like Georgia Gomelsky and Eddie Offord had on what you would do later? Well, I mean, my interaction with Eddie was pretty minimal, so I can't really speak to that. Um, but encountering a guy like Giorgio, I mean, as I said earlier, Giorgio was nuts. He was loopy. <laughs> But he was a creative genius in many ways. His mind was remarkable. The ideas that he had, I mean, a lot of them were completely impossible to be able to enact. And he would have needed fantastically large bankrolls to be able to pull them off. But his mind was, he was constantly concocting new schemes and, you know, just kind of like, it, it, was, it was really funny. I mean, he was just, trying to just work every angle. I mean, he was kind of, he was kind of like, he was a shifty, you know, con artist type guy. You know, he really was. He was just trying to figure out all, like every kind of angle that he could to make money and, and, and do all, do his crazy shit wherever and however he could. Um, so did you ever find yourself later on in your career thinking back to him, like things that he did that maybe you either thought you might try or maybe definitely wouldn't want to do? <laughs> um, you mean as a record producer? Yes. I didn't have that experience of Giorgio as someone who was like, who was a mentor in that way. I see. Giorgio set the stage for everything that all of us did. Gior Giorgio created the foundation. Right. Without Giorgio Gomelsky, There'd be no Zubin, there'd be no material, there'd be no Bill Laswell, no Michael Beinhorn, like none of, or Fred or any of us, none of us would have done what we were able to do. Giorgio is the nexus. He's like the initial point where all of us were able to meet. And, you know, I mean, for that matter, Martin as well, because right. he went on to do a lot of produ production. Um, and without Giorgio, it just wouldn't, none of this would have happened. Right. You know? I mean, everyone involved with uh, the New York Gong and the Zoo Band projects seemed to go on to some amazing things in the record business. Cliff Coltrary became uh, an A&R guy, um, discovered some important metal bands and others. Very, very important. And, so, and he worked with a lot of hip hop artists too. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, and I did some great stuff. Fred went on to work with uh, um, Lou Reed, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he did one of Lou Reed's most best-known records, New York. Right, right. And uh, and then there's, of course, Michael Beinhorn and, and all the things you've done. And again, I would implore people to look that up if you're not already familiar with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for uh, spending uh, a good chunk of time with me here. And I know uh, people are are <laughs> going to like listening to your stories about these early days. It was a lot of fun, Michael. Thank you. Cool. My pleasure. You're welcome. Okay. This is Zoo Band.
really been a terrific audience, and we're just asking you to stay patient just a little longer. We have a slight te technical difficulty, which we're ironing out very quickly.